I a, a great pleasure today to introduce uh, uh, Louis Skiner, uh, who will talk on politics and economic reform in uh, Uzbekistan. Um, uh, I've known Louis for more than 20 years now, and few people can match the breadth or the depth of his experiences working on issues related to legal reform, economic reform, the energy sector, the power sector. Uh, he's worked uh, as a lawyer with major corporate clients um, from Stad Oil to Gazprom. Uh, he's worked uh, on projects with the OECD, um, with EBRD. Uh, he briefs Chatham House. Uh, and few people, I think, can really match his experience and um, the deep substantive knowledge he brings and the good judgment he brings. I know uh, I've learned a lot from him over the years, and uh, I really look forward to learning more uh, today. Uh, if you have questions, uh, you can use uh, the chat function. Uh, the format for the talk will be that Lewis will talk, uh, give a presentation. Uh, I'll uh, abuse the chair's prerogative and ask a, a couple of questions myself before we open up the discussion uh, to the audience. Um, and I, I really look forward to, to hearing from you. And I think these sessions work best when there's a lot of interaction uh, with the audience. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll turn the, the floor over to Lewis. And uh, as he's speaking, think up your, your brilliant questions and uh, we'll get to them later in the broadcast. So uh, please join me in welcoming Louis Skynet. Thank you very much, Tim, for such a warm introduction. Um, to, to give you a bit of background, um, I lived in Moscow for many years, um, worked in Russia and on Russia, but in 2015 uh, left um for london uh primarily because of the, the the sanctions that were imposed the the year before uh had an impact on, on the work i was doing um and found myself by chance at a high table at cambridge university sitting next to the uzbek ambassador um who mentioned that um they needed someone to fly out to tashkent to to give a sort of duplo like explanation as to how to project finance energy projects um I, I speak a bit of russian and i don't know too much about project financing which was what they were looking for they didn't want someone to shoot way above their heads so i, I found myself on a plane to tashkent um in the middle of 2016 just prior to the death of karimov and in some way the rest is history um in, in that uh, after karimov's death as i guess everybody is aware um, the new president, Mr. Zoyev, um, introduced purposive reforms quickly. Um, and Uzbekistan has, I think, to ma managed to sustain its position in the limelight ever since because it, it's continued on that path. Um, we're going to look at that in more detail in the presentation. Um, I guess also as an introduction, um, your Secretary of State, um, Anthony Blinken was was in Tashkent last week. Um, obviously, um, its position is it, 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 it it's becoming more and more relevant given its geographical location, given what's going on in the region. Um, when I was last there, um, the government signed a, a gas supply agreement with Gazprom, um, which I guess is. One of the reasons Mr. Blinken was there uh, in that it, it, it's obvious that um, although the country has been independent for 30 years, although it's played a very clever game in terms of the relationships it's developed, both east, west, south, um, there will now be some competition uh, for influence. Uh, and it, it, it's, there's, there's no point in denying it. it the Russians would clearly prefer Uzbekistan to become more dependent um, than it has been in, in recent years. And indeed, as we'll look and discuss that, that will have an impact on the reform or at least how the reform is implemented, because clearly that the, the more off course it goes, then the, the more opportunities there are for um, for influence. Um, but but, but that, that, that's something we, we, we'll address in more detail. Um, 
I, I think to, to, to turn the clock back to this time last year, I, I was in Tashkent at the investment forum um, that the then Minister of uh, Investment uh, convened. The president was there. The, the heads of all the major IFIs were there. Um, the president, very, very impressive, very candid, very active, sits in a, a panel session for two and a half hours and doesn't just give a presentation. He also responds to questions uh, from the, his fellow panelists. So um, for those of you ha who haven't been there recently or haven't witnessed such an occasion, then I, I think you, you would be impressed by the willingness to, to, to engage. And the consensus at that meeting was that, you know, Uzbekistan would take a hit through 2022 um, because of the invasion of Ukraine and, and the sanctions that were being imposed on Russia. Um, it was the end of March, so um, the central bank had already begun to raise the interest rates. Um, they downed the macroeconomic forecast. They were expecting uh, real instability. That there was volatility in the currency exchange. Um, I think the biggest fear was probably the collapse in remittance payments, uh, as we'll come on to look at. They form quite a large part of GDP, so. Yeah, a year ago, I think people were worried in Tashkent that you know the the, the events in Ukraine and uh, and Russia were going to have a, a detrimental impact. Um, I went to the economic forum hosted by the Minister of Finance in Samarkand in November. Uh, similar type format, him on the stage with uh, the, the heads of the IFIs, or at least the regional heads of the IFIs, and and the consensus was that Uzbekistan had ridden the storm very well. Um, their GDP growth did drop, but it was 5.7%. And you know, most of us would be, be very happy with a 5.7% GDP growth. It was down 1.7% from the year before and wasn't significantly lower than, than had been predicted prior to the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Why is that? Well, um, I guess the primary reason is the sanctions on Russia haven't impacted on the Russian economy in the way everyone expected in March. I mean, people were talking about uh, a 15% recession. Um, the IMF has concluded that the Russian economy um, received a 2.2% GDP um, in 2022. Um, I think the other important factor when it comes to the relationship with Uzbekistan is that um, unemployment rates in Russia are at an all-time low, 3.7% um, in November 2022 which means that the Russian economy is still hungry for Central Asian workers. So that meant that in 2022, uh, remittance payments were almost 17 billion US dollars, which is 23% of, of GDP, and that's up from 2022. So that, that's a significant in, uh, factor in terms of um, the country's ability to ride the storm. Um, the other is the growth in exports. Um, capital flows have come in from Russia. Um, they've improved the current account. Foreign trade's grown. Russia's still the largest trading partner, both in and out. Um, and of course, Uzbekistan exports gold, um, and the price of gold has been high. It's not a large part, or it's not, it's not the majority of its export earnings. It's just above 25%. And I think that's another good explanation that Uzbekistan isn't like some of its neighbors in that it's not dependent on specific commodities. It has quite a wide export base. Um, and I guess the, the, the final point is that inflation uh, peaked. Um, we saw inflation at 12.3% in December, um, and the policy rate's now been reduced from 16 to 15%. So it, it looks like they've turned the corner in terms of, of inflation. You could also conclude that um, the government deserves a lot of credit for um, its ability to, to, to weather the storm because of the policies it's pursued. Um, if we start off with the budget deficit, which is the, you know, the, the normal place to start. Um, clearly, with Uzbekistan coming out of isolation only five, six years ago, uh, it had very, very low levels of sovereign and, and, and foreign debt. Um, but it hasn't uh, gone beyond the thresholds it set itself. 
Um, I think the overall total sovereign external debt is just above 35% and will decline. And the overall national external debt is, is well below 60% ceiling the government's set. Um, that means that the government has some room to um, increase expenditure on social programs. So uh, when there are issues, the government has been able to in in increase spending. Um, the budget deficit uh, was lower than expected, uh, narrowing to 5%. Tax receipts are growing. Uh, the trade balance, as we said, is improving with, with, with the growth in export revenue from gold, from copper. Um, and the current the country's foreign exchange reserves have grown 2% year on year in terms of the import cover. So every, you know, in that sense, there are many, many healthy indicators. Um, the prediction of the IFARIs, it, it varies, but GDP growth is set to, 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 to decline slightly in 2023. Um, it will be somewhere between 4.8 and 5.2%. Um, that's based on an assumption that inflation will slow. Uh, there'll be a continued tightening of financial conditions, softening of external demand, and, and a general slowdown. Um, and I guess that that's one of the issues for discussion is to what extent will that general global slowdown impact on, on the country, particularly the tightening of, of monetary policy and the shrinking of the fiscal space and, and the government's ability, therefore, to, 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 to implement reform. Um, if, if we turn to the reform, um, I guess many of you have followed parts of it. Uh, the first phase was spectacular. Um, September 2017, the currency liberalization, um, reduction in tariffs, changes in tax policy. Um, they found my macroeconomic stability relatively quickly. Uh, business confidence improved. Um, the second phase is always harder, but um, it was started a good good couple of years ago before the crisis in Ukraine. Um, attempts to reduce the transaction costs of business, to increase the finance available to the private sector through banking sector reform, implementing privatization by attracting investors, um, introducing public-private partnerships to build out infrastructure and power generation. Um, we've actually worked on a number of those projects. As I said, they were started even prior to the COVID lockdown. And some of those issues will, will, will form the, the, the more detail of the presentation going forward. Um, although, of course, you know, the, the, the reform has started and been implemented, um, there's still a consistent barometer to macroeconomic stability, and, and that is a low budget deficit a low inflation rate, positive trade balance, stable exchange rate. Um, and to that extent, although as we've seen, the, the picture so far is positive, um, the war in Ukraine, the lockdown in China, um, the sanctions, growing global instability, uh, global economic slowdown could still pose significant challenges, uh, particularly as, as Russia, as we said, is, is, is Uzbekistan's largest trading partner. So, so to go through some of those challenges, to, to give you some flavor as, as to the issues the government faces, well, as everywhere, the, the COVID pandemic created a supply bottleneck, causing increased commodity prices. Um, and as the global economy came out of lockdown, um, inflation was, was, was catalyzed. That's been exacerbated by, by the war in Ukraine. Um, you've had a rise in energy prices, a concomitant rise in food prices. Um, and a higher level of uncertainty. Um, I think as everywhere, the, the, the government clearly fears that inflation is going to become entrenched. Um, obviously, it can only afford inflation, serious inflation, to be a short-term phenomenon. If it becomes systemic, then salaries and social expenditure needs to be increased significantly. Um, I think the, the, the question is the, the desire to really uh, ratchet down um, and decrease inflation. Clearly, pressures are going to persist. I mean, the level of uncertainty is still high. It will impact on commodity and food prices, particularly given some of the supply issues we're going to, going to look at. Um, you still see very generous fiscal policies, growth in nominal wages, um, as we'll see 
one of the plans for the forthcoming year is the liberalization of, of the partial liberalization of the power sector so you'll see an increase in in energy prices utility prices and the last thing the government wants is is to face social unrest because people simply can't afford energy so some of the fiscal targets will be difficult to to, to meet because of the continued social spending and they will need to continue borrowing externally to to meet that but, but i think it's clear that the central bank um as with most central banks you know they they view inflation uh, as a um, more serious issue than over tightening monetary policy so you will see um, you know interest rates um, high for as long as is necessary in order to to, to counter inflationary spikes investment well Uzbekistan's consistently run a current account deficit that, that's been financed, as we said, by, by the government contracting external debt. Um, the FDI hasn't been too impressive, um, and the government's very cognizant of that. So most economic growth has been driven by public investment. Um, and the current account deficit is widening. So it's expected to widen even further, even further in the next year with the increased import of capital goods. Um, and this poses a problem for the country because with increased inflation, with the increased tightening of monetary conditions globally, the cost of debt becomes more expensive. You've got pressure on capital, you've got reduction in, in, in economic growth, it limits the government's fiscal scope. Um, and you can only deal with this widening current account problem uh, partly by increased export uh, revenue, be it gold prices or, or income through remittances, that only covers part of the gap. Um, so clearly now is the time to really uh, introduce and implement privatization. Um, we, we've mentioned how privatization has been pursued over the last three years on a PPP basis. Um, there's been an attempt to diversify the number of players in the economy to incentivize private investment um, simply because the government is no longer on its own able to finance infrastructure through through public expenditure what, what's clear is the government really needs to pursue structured reforms here to encourage fdi as a capital flow um, we'll, we'll talk in a bit more detail about this uh, the privatization of state-owned enterprises um, yes it's been on the agenda for four years now but Basically, instead of offering your worst assets uh, for sale and offering minority stakes in your worst assets, you've got to offer your better assets and offer assets that are already uh, at least partly prepared for privatization in that there has been a thorough and purposive reorganization. Um, there's proper accounting, et cetera, et cetera. So in, investors have to be offered really attractive investment opportunities. And then to go back to another point we just made, um, if you're looking at you know, utilities or, or, or power projects, uh, the liberalization of prices in the market is, is a key part of that because investors have to believe and have confidence they're actually going to make money from uh, investing lots of capital in building out infrastructure. Um, the unbundling of utilities requires consumer price rises. Um, it's a cost of modernization. So, so the government's going to have to work hard to manage those tensions. And I, I guess also to take a step back, um, we're focusing very much on the last five years, but um, historically, the country has been perceived to be a high risk one because of the issues of repatriating money, uncertainty of exchange rate, the, the low confidence in the judicial system, um, protection of property rights, instability of legislation. Um, yes, the, the president's appetite and energy for reform and, and willingness to reform partly assuages some of these concerns. But when you start reforming by decree, uh, as I guess we saw in Russia 30 years ago with all the Ukav that uh, Yeltsin uh, passed, um, you create confidence, but you also create a sense that there's no systemized approach to law. So having project-based decrees as opposed to well-thought-through reformed legislation also creates 
creates concern. Capital market, well, well clearly a key ingredient to, to reform is a, is a domestic capital market. Um, there's limited access to capital in Uzbekistan because the financial market is undeveloped. underdeveloped. Um, loans are very expensive, difficult to access. Credit levels are low. Um, it's not acting as a catalyst to GDP growth. Um, the government, as we said, so far has seemed to be more interested in raising debt abroad. Uh, there's been a various uh, sovereign and quasi-sovereign uh, issuances on international exchanges. Um, clearly, it needs to focus a bit more on developing its own domestic exchange because a domestic capital market is, is a very good way of providing finance for domestic companies. It's a very good way of uh, capturing domestic savings. Clearly, there are a lot of domestic savings that just simply aren't in circulation. Um, and if you look at how economies develop, then the smaller companies that uh, are successful, um, where perhaps there are foreign investors um, involved, um, the exit is the domestic capital market. The exit isn't you know, doing an IPO in London or, or wherever. So if you want to encourage investment and you've got to give investors a belief that there is an exit sometime in the future on a domestic market where, 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 where shares can be, be, be floated. Other challenges, well, regional relations, clearly that is a, a more and more complicated issue. Uh, the last 20 years has witnessed increased integration um, largely based on regional trade. There's been a harmonization of tariffs with the European, Eurasian Economic Union. Um, Uzbekistan's been working to enter the WTO. And I, I think one of the very, very visible um, policies that the president pursued, particularly in, in his first year, was to improve the relationships with, with neighboring countries by, by visiting them. But I think he visited his neighbors before he visited some of the more well-known foreign capitals. And that was you know, a very conscious decision. Um, integration, of course, now has halted. Um, sanctions on Russia have huge impact on, on supply to the re region because Russia is now off limits. Um, Uzbekistan is sitting you know, in the middle of Afghanistan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan. It, the vulnerability now is exacerbated by the fact it's double landlocked. Um, becomes highly dependent on its neighbors. Um, so regional connectivity uh, in the context of a global economic slowdown uh, with Russia out of the picture, uh, with continued concerns about um, China production, um, it, it's a real issue and, and needs to be tackled head on. Um, as we'll see in the conclusion, there's lots of talks about southern corridors uh, with the Middle East, Pakistan and India. Some of it seems, you know, fantasy more, more, more than reality, but, you know, that there, there are now serious discussions about developing infrastructure south to, to Iranian ports and Pakistani ports in order to, 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 to create connectivity in, in the region. Cleaner energy, I mean, that, that's another issue that is as relevant for the region as it is for us in, in the developed world. Um, energy efficiency needs to be improved, carbon emissions need to be reduced. It's critical, um, not just in terms of economic growth, but also in terms of minimizing climate impact. Um, climate impact, of course, is felt perhaps more acutely in, in Uzbekistan than, than elsewhere. Um, so it's another area where the government needs to, to implement and develop effective policies. It's all about transparency information. I mean, you, you, you can't develop uh, climate change policies unless you have accurate information about, you know, what do your key industries admit? You, you need an inventory of fossil fuel subsidies. You need to establish the price and then you need to create price incentives. Um, so when it comes to energy transition, clearly, you know, there's a lot of basic work to be done um to understand the cost and benefit of projects going forward over over their life cycle um because it's only if you can understand the impact of projects going forward over their life cycle then you can begin to effectively challenge public expenditure and, and raise financing and uh, award um tax cuts for, for energy efficient 
facilities. So to sort of to head towards the conclusion, um, I think it's it's always important to to, to remember the starting point. Um, Mrs. Zori became president what in December 2016, officially elected at least. So he's been in the job a little over six years, and um, I, I think it's you know to, to some extent it, it's the same with Russia. I mean may, maybe now. We'll look back on that period at the end of the 90s when we were perhaps overcritical about, you know, some of the faults that were being made and, and wonder well, why, what, why, why didn't we realize at the time that they they done a huge amount to 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 to, to, to reform uh, institutions, economic behavior. I mean, yes, um, things were going in different directions. It wasn't consistent. There were a lot of contradictions. But uh, as one of my Uzbek friends. Uzbek friend said recently, um, never say it's too late to go back. Um, so, so, so clearly, you know, we should applaud the fact that, 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 that there has been real momentum created um, with the currency liberalization, with the reduction in tariffs, with tax policy, um, financial regulations been strengthened, uh, corporate governance has improved in some sectors, and social assistance has clearly been a, a key to them country uh, getting through the COVID pandemic. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done, and it, it's the reform of state-owned enterprises, um, particularly banks. As we said, the banking sector is critical. Uh, improving health and education, um, that obviously involves TPPs, and liberalizing prices in order to get uh, real prices into the economy. Um, there is, I think, a growing concern that um, five years in, that the, the steam is beginning to 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 to, to, to run out. Uh, that we're witnessing a slowdown of reforms. But then, um, you know, coming from the UK, I think any second-term president um, or prime minister, uh, the reforms start to slow down. It, it 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 seems to be you know just an inevitable part of a second-term premiership. I mean, certainly with with, with the, the the Blair example, it, it, it's a good comparison. Um, yeah, privatization, it has to be the priority. Uh, we've already talked about that, that you need capital flows. Um, you need to present attractive investment opportunities, um, but you need to do this in an arm's length way. Um, I think the development banks, the IFIs, they focus a lot on the procedures. Um, they don't really take a step back and look at the philosophy. Um, I think privatization has just become a mantra now, hasn't it? In, in that well, most of us accept it as part of part of life, um, that it provides good. Um, maybe so, you know, maybe, maybe the issue is they haven't really sat down and thought, well, what, what is best to privatize now? What is better to retain a national ownership? And at what speed should we be, be privatized, like privatizing, um, particularly, you know, across sectors? Um, what, what's critical is when you do privatize, you have a proper competitive tender, uh, and that whoever wins actually is going to invest in that industry, in that sector, and is going to add value both through its ability to finance development and also through its experience. So one of the more worrying tendencies we're witnessing is that uh, privatizations result in um, deals that aren't totally transparent, and there is a concern that they're not done in an arm's length way. Um, creating confidence, we talked about that. Uh, the government's launched a new strategy, 2022 to 2026. Um, two of the pillars of protecting property rights, eliminating state interference, improving conditions for private business. Uh, lots of solutions proposed for that, industrial zones, business incubators. It's all state-led. Um, I think what, what, what they neglect is actually as important to creating the framework is to end project specific subsidies, to, to phase out cost subsidization, to abandon preferential tax treatment, um, to ensure that permissions licenses are issued in a transparent, um, non discriminant way. So to, to create confidence that there's a, there's a level playing field. And, and clearly, again, that's an issue because. Um, Certain 
people or uh, interests um, are able to access um, projects and preferences more easily th 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 than others. Um, consistency, uh, clearly investors want to see consistency um, in public decision making. I think the government's very conscious of that. They've reduced the number of ministries and agencies from 61 to 28. Uh, there was little consensus about their respective roles. So uh, having less obviously to some extent makes it easier, but it's still unclear in the short to medium term whether or not this will actually lead to an improvement in implementation and delivery uh, of policy. Um, there's many global headwinds out there, as we've seen in the introduction. Um, you need to gain credibility through the way in which you deal with them by implementing medium term policies, by providing predictability um, for medium term growth. So the focus has to be very much on medium term. What, I guess what, what one of the achievements of the past few years is to introduce medium term uh, budgeting and planning into, into the government cycle. So uh, planning is now done on, on a three year basis. Um, Medium term fiscal policy, of course, is a key part of that, um, both due to the social impact of, of commodity prices and the financial, um, the, the, the problems in financial markets when you don't have financial predictability. So medium term fiscal policy, yeah, a key. Um, and trade offs, I mean, it, inevitably, there will be trade offs. Um, so the, the quality of government expenditure is, is increasingly important as the fiscal space uh, is reduced. Um, its decisions have to be well thought through and when it does face a trade-off, it needs to be making uh, the right decision based on, on, on the right information or access to information. Um, yeah, we've talked about reform of the financial service sector, uh, developing the domestic capital market, um, one of the positive, I guess, things of the, the, the past year is the inflow of capital. Um, a lot of Russian money, of course, has moved to Uzbekistan, both large and, and, and medium. Um, legislation needs to be introduced uh, to make it easy to put capital to use. Uh, for example, the hiring of personnel. Um, you know, the, the, the service sector is, is key to countries going through economic transition at the moment the service sector is, is relatively small so um, there are opportunities that the, the the crisis or the global situation has created that, that Uzbekistan can can use in its favor um, to finalize systemic threats um, climate change as we said food security regional connectivity conflict avoidance um, well, clearly, connectivity is a, an important catalyst for, for regional economic growth, more important given the global slowdown, uh, given fragmentation. Um, you need to be able to reduce costs, develop markets regionally. Um, there is a lot of focus on that, on regional policy dialogue, on regional coordination. Um, there's an EU Central Asia strategy that's been launched. Um, Central Asia as a region is very much uh, seen as a gateway to the larger region. Um, I think the EBRD has been tasked with producing a feasibility study on new transport infrastructure routes by, by May uh, in preparation for a, a big conference they're having in, 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 in both Almaty and Samarkand. So uh, the regional connectivity is, is, is certainly an issue that's in, in focus. Um, and if you look at some of the ways of achieving that, well, uh, implementing PPP projects, um, infrastructure uh, involving private investment, uh, improving regional integration, um, a lot of it is energy related and, and clearly having cross-border infrastructure and regional energy trading benefits the region, um, not just in terms of reducing conflict, but in terms of, uh, of climate change. And you're beginning to see that, you're beginning to see power flows going between countries. Uh, clearly they all have um, different uh, advantages. Um, so you, you're seeing hydro projects now being developed in Tajikistan, which can supply uh, power into to, to Uzbekistan. Um, so so that, that is an issue that's also being 
focused on. Um, in terms of the green transition, well, as we mentioned, you know, a lot needs to be done at the base level first. Um, but then, yes, I mean, Uzbekistan needs to, to think about how to mobilize reserves, how to attract green international financing, you know, carbon pricing, taxonomies, what qualifies as a green investment, um, green bonds, carbon credits. Um, they've all been attractive to, to, to sovereign wealth funds, institutional investors, even to private commercial banks. I mean, it hasn't happened yet in, in, in Uzbekistan. Most energy projects are still um, financed by the IFIs. There's very little private uh, finance going in, but clearly there's, there's tremendous scope for that with improved regional connectivity, uh, with, with, with cross-border um, power flows. So yeah, that, 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 that's basically what, what, what I have prepared. I mean, as, as I said in the introduction um, and throughout, um, I, I think it's a, a real achievement in, in, in terms of um, the president's uh, ability to, 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 to impose himself on, on the government and to, to, to ensure that a lot of what he, he sees as important, his vision for the country has, has become reality. And it's, it's clearly a very, very different country than it was in the, in the, in the last days of, of Karimov's rule. Um, um, we haven't touched on civil society. I, I understand that, that, that that's negligence of me not, 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 not to touch on, on such issues. But I mean, it's, it's obvious when you visit that, that there is much wider and freer discourse. Uh, there's more public participation. And in, indeed, one of the president's um, key, well, one, one of the key planks of his vision going forward is to to, to, to revive the system of sort of local self-government and, and, and get local people involved into, in, in, into the governance of, of, of their regions and localities. Um, and there's also, there's, there's been a high turnover of people in positions, and that's primarily because there's a lot of people coming back from, from the US, from, from Europe, who, who, who've had a career, be it in investment banking or, or whatever, uh, and have taken positions in government. And the, 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 the people you now meet across the table, they are younger and more literate financially and um, I, I guess more able to to understand the perspectives of of investors and, and capital providers and, and banks so uh, that, that there is much more now scope for uh, real engagement so in in that sense yeah I mean it, 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 there's no comparison between where, where the country was six years ago and where it is now. Great, thanks a lot. That was uh, that was terrific. Um, I have a, a few questions. Um, uh, one is, so you you paint a picture, uh, you know, considerable success at the macro level, right? And that's something that technically is easier to do. Uh, it often doesn't invoke the same kinds of distributional conflicts uh, over. Um, who gets what um, in the same way that the micro level reforms do. Uh, you know, they're, they're often much more politically painful. Um, and, you know, it's typically the case that it's the incumbents who have uh, an uneven playing field. And the difficult thing that reformers face is building a coalition uh, that can challenge um, incumbents. Um, sometimes those coalitions involve foreign partners. Sometimes um, they involve, you know, more nimble uh, private sector firms. Uh, can you talk a little bit um, in more detail about the uh, the obstacles to these kinds of uh, second stage? micro level reforms is the uzbek case typical of what we've seen in, in, in lots of other countries or are there some things that are more peculiar uh, about the uzbek case that make it uh, particularly interesting 
It, 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 it's a very relevant question. Um, I mean, I, I guess similar to other centrally planned economies that have gone through a transition process, um, there are key industries that are strategic in that they are cash cows for the budget and they are cash cows for the individuals who run them uh, and people who occupy important positions politically. Um, I guess if you look at, say, Central Europe, then clearly those economies have gone in very different trajectories in that some of them uh, were more or less successfully privatized and, uh, and, and are now owned by private individuals. And you, you, you see a healthy oligarchy and that, you know, you, you, you'll you see a couple of dozen family offices. I'm thinking, you know, a com country like the Czech Republic um, that have developed uh, those industries and modernized those industries. And then you see countries like Poland where, you know, uh, and Hungary where um, you, you've seen the public ownership resurface, but, but both polit for political reasons, um, probably more so for political reasons than for personal benefit. Yeah. Um, but but you, you see this sort of less healthy sort of um, juxtaposition of, of private interest and, and public. Um, I guess Uzbekistan is a sort of third way in that, you know, clearly the government wouldn't want to um, embark on a rapid liberalization of you know, something like utilities or power or gas, because it will be terrified of private companies coming in and just messing it up. And then, you know, before you know it, you're faced with thousands of people burning tires at crossroads and protesting. Um, so, you know, there are clear, clearly legitimate concerns, but, you know, as you've hinted at, you know, there are also vested interests. Um, in Uzbekistan, I think the gas sector is is clearly one where you're really seeing problems. I mean, there's there's been some bad coverage recently. I don't know to what extent you've been following it, but there's been some reports about linkage between Timchenko, Uzmanov, and and the local players, and it, it's an open secret. I mean, you know, yeah. the, 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 the Uzbek Nifty Gas was awarding all its contracts to Enter Engineering to Aerial. Um, and they became the sort of default contractor, not just for oil and gas, but for power. Even Rosatom had them as the main contractor on, on, on the, the nuclear power station that was meant to be built. Um, a lot of that's financed by Gazprom Bank. Um, Uzmanov is a local boy um, mm -hmm. who's now at home, at, partly because he's got nowhere else to go. But, you know, his, his plane has been on the tarmac in Tashkent since about May. So, um, yes. The, 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 I guess one of, if we're being candid, one of the potential scenarios is as Russian money has less places to go, um, then maybe Russian money would actually encourage uh, a reversion and a consolidation of of the sort of incumbent vested interest where their their cut gets bigger and bigger. Um, Metals and metallurgy um, is another interesting sector, clearly very important with gold, with uranium, with, with copper, um, and also with other metals than now that are more important given the electrification of economies. Um, there's been a lot of talk about reforming Navoi. Um, you know, they were meant to already be, you know, some way down the road in terms of corporate reorganization and preparing for bonds and IPOs, I mean, they're, they're nowhere near the plan uh, because clearly there are vested interests that don't want anyone to understand the revenues and cash flows in in, in, in that business. Um, and you know, having increased Russian interest is not going to help. Um, although having said that, you know, some of the the homegrown oligarchs, when they did come back at the beginning of the Mizozoyev presidency, um, I'm thinking you know, uh, the Shadiyas who, who've obviously developed PRG in Kazakhstan, um, you know, that the, 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 they were told quite clearly, you know, you're not going to come back and take over. But 
that wasn't necessarily for the right reasons. It was just that mm. they were they were local guys who didn't want to have to move over. Um, so yes, yeah, I mean, the, 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 it's an issue. But I, I think where Uzbekistan differs, if we take out, you know, mining, metallurgy, gas, then, you know, a lot of what the economy does is quite diverse and is it the margins aren't massive um you know textiles obviously food vegetables um i represent a couple of private equity funds that have been investing you know for a good few years now in, in basically it's more like venture capital but in in, in sort of fintech uh, startups uh, who basically fill the gaps in value chains because you know in a country where you don't have a proper financial system banking system you you need to have sort of quasi financial players that make processes easier make uh, financing more available make things lower cost and easily accessible so you know ironically in Uzbekistan you've seen it's not a caspi like you have in, in in Kazakhstan you know sort of publicly listed platform um but you do see some very very impressive um businesses developing payment systems etc cetera, etc cetera, um that allow people to transact at lower cost and more effectively um and i i think that the the hope for uzbekistan is that because it's not so dependent on on the the, the commodities and because maybe we can just sort of we can cordon off that sector and say, well, it's, you know, it's not an easy solve anyhow. I think the rest of the economy will look after itself. And, and certainly you're seeing that, you know, the, the, the retail is, is becoming more sophisticated, improving, um, you know, the amount of money people are spending is, is increasing, the way they're spending it is, is becoming more, more sophisticated. Um, so it's almost like there are two Uzbek economies. There's, there's there's one that 80 plus percent of the population inhabit and work in, and there's another one that the state is, or people who represent the state uh, want to sort of continue having a, a monopoly on. Clearly, it's critical, and you know you can't have a balanced budget and you can't have a healthy national economy without that that other economy contributing, but. I, I think the the real private sector creates so much just dynamic on the street that um, it, it will keep pushing forward modernization no matter what the government does. Um, and that that for me is I think that, that, that that's the hope. Yeah, I think that's what we see in some of the more successful cases in Eastern Europe after the transition as well. It was. Uh, uh, the private sector eventually swallowing uh, some of the sectors that had been dominated by the state where it made sense for them to be in private hands rather than in uh, state hands. Okay. Um, the audience has been very, I have a bunch more questions, but I, I want to respect the audience who've been very patient. We have a question from Barry Rogers, who writes that he makes regular visits to Tashkent, and it's been disturbing to experience really quite serious structural power failures. Uh, this is not good. Uh, what are they doing about this? Well, it's a very good question. And yes, I mean, I was there just after the last series of blackouts in, in January. Um, there is a power deficit. Um, that's clear. Um, the They inherited, I think, about 11 gigawatts of capacity. That's been reduced. Um, Clearly, the Uzatom project was meant to, you know, add a couple of gigawatts. That's not going to happen. Um, there has been a whole series of, of, of wind and solar projects initiated, many of which we worked on, both wind and solar. Um, most of them financed by IFIs, partly financed. But now you see, you know, big regional players like Aqua, the Saudis, Mazda um, as well. Um, sponsoring projects and you know that they, they, they are actually dominant in the sense that um that they, 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 they have whole whole portfolios of, of new wind and, and solar projects um the, the problem is is that a lot of those projects haven't 
either reached financial close or haven't reached commissioning. Um, that I think is partly explicable by um, herding the cats in the government in that, you know, you've got various stakeholders in, a, in an energy project. So you've got the Ministry of Energy, you've got the Ministry of Investment, uh, you've got the PPDA, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, it's often very difficult to, 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 to make sure, and the Ministry of Finance um, obviously is critical in terms of the financial model and the commercial terms that, 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 that the investor is asked to agree to. Um, I, I think it's, it, it's it, yeah, of course, it's challenging to, to, to get a consensus and COVID didn't help because people weren't traveling and you couldn't all sit in a room and say, you know, we're not leaving until everyone's agreed on something. It's very easy to do a Zoom call and it's very easy not to conclude a Zoom call with, 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 with you know, a, a structured list, to-do list. Um, the, the other issue, of course, is, is also COVID related and that's um, supply. I mean, most of the kit that the Aquas and the Mazdas were going to use was coming out of China. Um, those workshops have been standing still um, and there is massive now global demand for, for wind turbines. I mean, we, we had our annual renewable conference a couple of weeks ago in Frankfurt. And um, even though the EU is drunk on ambition in the sense that in response to the Russian invasion and Europe's dependency on fossil fuels were going to, you know, sort of ramp up um, our, our, our green capacity many fold. Um, what, what one of the speakers reminded everyone that, um, you know, someone's got to supply all the kit and you're talking about, you know, a handful of companies who do it, you know, in, 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 on scale. Um, so, you know, a lot of the problems that impacted on Uzbekistan are the same that have impacted elsewhere and are just more acute because of Uzbekistan's geographical position. Um, but then hitting on what I've said in answer to Tim's question, the other issue, of course, is, you know, the gas sector, um, you know, gas fired power stations um, are still key in the mix because you don't have nuclear, um, you know, you don't have yet uh, a large portfolio of, of wind and solar projects. And the, the, the challenge has been gas supply. And, and, and um, it's no secret. I mean, Ariel were awarded many, many contracts to drill wells and those wells aren't producing efficiently. So, so the output of, of, of the gas industry has collapsed under Uzbek Nyeti Gaz management. Um, and that's also having you know a, a big impact on on the system's ability to deliver power. In, interestingly, the mayor was the Tash Kemp was the one who was made the fall guy, so he he was fired. Um, he actually has nothing to do with the power system, but obviously the blackouts were most acutely felt in in Tash Kemp. So the president needed someone high up to publicly at least be be shamed. Um, there was a big turnout around in the Ministry of Energy. Um, the result is, and I can say this because we're working on various projects, is the projects are even further away from closing because now you've got, you, you're on calls every day with people who maybe haven't read a PPA or a GSA or worked on a, on a PPP. So, you know, at least the other guys you, you've been working with for two or three years, they were the ones who'd slowly, you know, got to understand the agreements and were prepared to defend them internally. And, and now, you know, you're faced with a whole new team of people who are terrified of making the wrong decision because they really don't understand the documents that are on their desk. So I, I don't think this is an issue that's going to go away quickly. Um, clearly, the supply issues are going to get worse. And Yes, I mean, the solution has been to, to, to sign an agreement with Gazprom. Um, so you've got both Turkmen gas and, and, and Russian gas now coming into Uzbekistan. Um, there's, there's been talk as well about having proper competitive tenders for drilling. Um, so a number of clients who, who've been looking at enhanced production. Um, you know, you have a lot of very skillful EMP companies now that don't do big projects. They just go into brownfields and they get out of the wells, you know, the, the hydrocarbons that the, the, the big players leave. Um, 
I mean, th there's been discussion about letting them in, but on what terms? I mean, that's the problem because you, you, if you want to have, you know, risk service agreements, which are typically the way you do it because they don't have interest in in the in the license, you, you're talking about, you know, them hitting a production plateau, and then once they go above it, they earn some sort of premium. But 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 you really need proper information. Um, up front for companies to understand the risks before they go into such arrangements. And again, you know, that, that's a big issue because the, the quality of the information is, is poor and the understanding of how to run competitive tenders is poor because they don't really, you know, there's not a realization that companies need a, a long lead in time to analyze the data in order to make a proposal. Um, so yeah, I, in answer to the question, it's, it's not an issue that's going to go away quickly. So another question, and this reminds me of a comment that Tom Graham said once that I've stolen on many occasions where he said, you know, <clears throat> we often talk about post-Soviet Central Asia, but we should be talking about pre-Chinese Central Asia. So uh, yeah, the quiz question is about the role of foreign investment um, from Russia and China. How do they compare with each other is there space for Russian investment to be a positive influence or will it just lead to more dependence? Uh, as a possible alternative, does China seems to be diversifying its investments in Uzbekistan? Uh, you know, is, is it better in some sense you know, to have, uh, from the point of view of Uzbekistan, to have uh, investment from one, from China, from Russia, from both? Uh, is there some mix that, that that's right? Uh, um, and are there other IFIs that might be, um, or, or foreign countries that might be able to, to play a role? So you could just talk a little bit about the uh, role of foreign investment, particularly with uh, interest from Russia and China. I mean, the, the, I think like Kazakhstan, the, 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 the Uzbek government has tried to, diversify the, the sources of investment in order to achieve balance. Um, I think there was a lot of initial interest from, from China, um, but I think the Uzbek government was, was very cautious of the terms of, of investment. I mean, we, we, we read a lot about non-sustainable debt, the, the, the fact that yes, you get a lot of seemingly attractive financing, but all the financing ends up back in China because um, it, it's Chinese companies who are, are building out the infrastructure. Um, yes, of course, as we've already mentioned, Lukoil have been a big player in the gas sector um, and also um, midstream. Um, Gazprom have been a participant in upstream and midstream projects. Gazprom Bank are a major uh, financer uh, of of those projects plus plus enter and aerial the, the, the main contractors so you know the russians are, are, are clearly involved um but that's not the full story i mean uh, there's a lot of money coming from the gulf i mean you had the uzomani fund that was 250 million it was a sort of joint sovereign fund um the emirati have set up a a similar Joint sovereign fund, uh, which they basically have capitalized, um, similar to the sort of Russian direct investment model that you you you, you leverage uh, your domestic uh, sovereign expenditure and you you attract um, sovereign funds from around the world. Uh, the, the, the 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 challenge there has not been the lack of desire. The challenge has been organizing it and also finding projects that are big enough and good enough for that type of investment. I mean, when, when, you know, Uzbekistan, I think before COVID, when it was, you know, very much a big story, I remember going to events in New York and London, and loads of people were talking about raising big funds to invest in Uzbekistan. But you know, the reality is you, you struggle to spend money if, if you have, you know, quite strict parameters in terms of what your LPs or what you've agreed with your LPs um, you, you can spend the money on, then um, there aren't many, you know, successful medium-sized businesses. 
in Uzbekistan that need growth capital. Um, but that, 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 that you know, my, my, my point there is that, that you know there's been a lot of in, interest from the Gulf, and of, obviously Mazda and Aqua are sovereign-backed companies, and they are the ones that are uh, very active in the power sector. Um, and then when it comes to Europe, I mean, I don't think it's through a lack of ambition. I mean, EDF um, are now in one of the combined cycle projects. Um, Voltalia have. Um, you know, I think either they are involved or have been trying to get involved in, in various projects. A lot of the major European players have uh, gone to Uzbekistan with the hope of, of getting projects. Um, and the government is constantly, you know, in Germany, in, in France, uh, trying to sign uh, MOUs uh, and develop projects with, with the large European manufacturers, because I, I think you know, going forward, one of the things the Uzbeks would hope from Europe would be that um, you can have a knowledge transfer and you can actually add value in country. Um, you see that particularly with electronic products. Um, and there, you know, the Koreans are active. I mean, Samsung are a major investor in Artel. Koreans have also extended, you know, financing for, for other projects in the, in the chemical sector. So, there's actually a larger mix than than one would assume. Um, so no, yeah, there, there, yes, there is a danger that the shadow of Russia will get longer, and it won't be positive. Um, but I, I think you know, given the strategy of the government, I, I, I think they will work actively to ensure that that that, that doesn't happen. And occasionally bringing in Anthony Blinken to uh, symbolically demonstrate that message. So. Well, that, 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 that's the interesting point. There isn't actually that much U.S. investment. Yeah. Um, and again, I, I don't think it's for lack of ambition. I, I, I think you know U.S. companies have been out there, but you know it, it's not a place Exxon are going to invest in because you know if you look at the reserves available, you know yeah. they wouldn't get out of bed for it. Um, so I think that that's the problem has been, you know, the sectors that attract the big, say, U.S. companies, uh, that the, the, there's, there's not the numbers either in terms of people or business to actually get them interested. Um, so, it, it, you know, we, we talk a lot about the need to have investment, but ultimately private companies only invest if they're going to make money. So it has to make sense from a bottom line perspective. We have a follow-up question, which is right along those lines uh, from Nargis Kasenova, uh, uh, which asks about uh, Gazprom's and Gazprom's increasing influence in the gas market. Um, is this buying done primarily for business uh, purposes? Uh, is there primarily economic interest driving this? Um, or is it being done primarily for political purposes? Uh, and there could could there be a positive effect from having Gazprom contribute to regional gas trade? Well, I mean, I think it's a combination and it depends on which side of the table you're sitting on. I, I think clearly from the Russian perspective, it's being done for political and economic purposes because there is a surplus of gas and they are selling gas at discount mm. uh, because of the collapse of supply to the European market. And there is infrastructure to to sell gas into Uzbekistan. I mean, clearly they built out infrastructure to China with the power of Siberia. I mean, we can talk about West Siberian routes through Altai. Um, they they weren't built, um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's going to be a slow process building infrastructure east to to to, to compensate for the the lack of sales going west. Um, so yeah. I think on the Russian side, it is it is economic if you look at Gazprom's interest, and it's political if you look at the bigger Russian interest. Um, on the Uzbek side, it, it goes back to the last question about the blackouts. I mean, clearly they had to do something um, because they have a, a power deficit, and the reason they have a power deficit is they don't produce enough gas, uh, so they needed gas. Um, one could argue that they could have taken more gas from Turkmenistan, but you know, ultimately, if 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 someone is promising, you know, 
large volumes of gas at good terms, then they, they, they will take it. It also, as we've discussed, it will help consolidate the position of various Russian players um, in the industry. Um, so I, I think, yes, it has a positive impact in that hopefully they won't be subject to or vulnerable to, 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 to such power outages or gas shortages. I don't think it will help in terms of the liberalization of the gas market. But then, you know, we worked on the liberalization of the gas market at the World Bank a couple of years ago, and it, it, it was one of those occasions where, you know, you as a team of consultants are taking out something that's been done for another country a few years ago and trying to change a few things to make it fit for purpose in the new country. And no matter how you looked at it, you thought this just isn't going to work because um, you know, the idea of having a competitive gas market, it took Europe um, you know, decades to come to grips with it. And some European countries you know, arguably don't have a competitive gas market. So the, the idea that Uzbekistan could, could, could unbundle and introduce competition in, in transportation and then in distribution, I mean, it's it depends what you're measuring it against, um, but clearly it, it, it's not going to help the overall process of reform. Good. So a uh, question here about uh, presidential resolution identifying 31 large SOEs for reform and transformation. Employment at these firms is very high, much higher than it would be yet here uh, firms in more competitive economies, uh, transforming them and privatizing them will likely lead to layoffs. Uh, does the government have a strategy for this? Uh, uh... I mean, it's, 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 it's a perennial question, isn't it? I mean, you know, clearly in, in some sectors where you do have a lot of labor, um, one of the consequences of reorganizing is going to be layoffs. Um, and I mean, to, to some extent, maybe in the West, we we underestimate the social function of, 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 of large enterprises because we think there are fairly fluid liquid markets um, where workers who've lost a job in one enterprise can then go and find a, a job in another. Um, or, or I think as Norman Tebbit said in the 80s, they can get on their bike and find an, another one. Well, clearly that didn't, you know, that wasn't the case in the north of England in 1985 whenever he said it, because, um, you know, the north of England didn't have, uh, you know, a diverse base of industry. Um, one of the, you know, things we discussed before was the, the private sector. Um, I, I guess, you know, that is the way out for the government is that if they create a, a, a framework that really supports and encourages private sector activity, if they get the tax policies right, so you know the tax burden is lowered, and they have lowered VAT, haven't they? So there'll be less earnings from VAT. But if you, if you make the tax system more efficient, so people are paying less, but the government's still collecting more, um, then hopefully the, the private sector will soak up um, a lot of that labor. Um, I guess, yeah, the, the other hope would be that if, if the Russian economy doesn't collapse, um, then, you know, a lot of that labor will inevitably, you know, go and work outside Uzbekistan and be part of contributing 23% of GDP. So, um, the, the, there's both a domestic process in terms of the private market growing, and there's also, I guess, an unspoken hope that Uzbek workers will still be able to find jobs elsewhere and, and, and send very valuable money back to Uzbekistan. Um, yeah, the, 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 fl the fluidity of the labor market is an issue that's not just economic, it also touches on uh, housing and people's willingness to move from place to place. So it's a challenging one. Uh, uh, Gulia Regenova, apologies for the pronunciation, asks that you touch on the role of Saida Mirzoyeva, the president's daughter, who seems to have carved out a more progressive role in the public's eye. Uh, 
I know commenting on the families of, of high politicians is is often a tricky business uh, it, it, for lots of reasons. Uh, uh, do you have any thoughts on this? I mean, it's, it's not something I focus a lot on. I mean, um, there has been increasingly frequent comments recently about the number of family and friends in government, and I, 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 I think clearly initially Mrs. Zoyev was very conscious of the precedent. Um, you know, clearly the precedent wasn't a good one at all with, with Bulgara uh, Karimova, um, and. To that extent, I, I think in the initial couple of years, um, you know, that the, the family were kept out of um, politics. But yeah, clearly, family members and extended family members and childhood friends of family members now are occupying more and more senior positions. And yes, if you, if you talk with people. And not just behind closed doors. I mean, this is one of the clearly the positive developments is people are happy to say in public that it's not good when this this development becomes the modus operandi because you know it's harder to you know replace or remove or fire somebody who is part of your family than if they if they weren't. Um, but no, I mean it's. It, it, it 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 is it is potentially an issue, um, but I, I I think it's something clearly he will have to think carefully about going forward, because um, yes, you need you need loyalty, and I think again it's something we misunderstand in the West because you know a lot of the people surrounding Putin, people are saying, well, how the hell has that happened? Um, well, they're just, they're just loyal. I mean, you know, he he, he trusts them, and in in, in these cultures often loyalty has a, a much higher value than than we appreciate um so yes clearly the president does need loyal people but but, but he also needs to ensure that yeah that, that, that there isn't a monopoly yeah. great um here's a question uh, an interesting one about um access to present projects to you know, various levels of governments. Um, to what extent do foreigners have kind of equal access compared to locals? Uh, is there, you know, uh, the implicit complaint here is foreigners being shut out of opportunities to present projects that um, end up going to locals? Is that a uh, um, not an uncommon uh, 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 problem, but uh, could you talk a little bit about it in the context of Uzbekistan? I mean, I, I think, again, well, again, it's no secret that the, the, the size of the pyramid is very steep. Um, yeah. And if, if we're looking at the typical story of a potential foreign investor, he will go to an embassy um, in his country, and the ambassador has you know, the ability normally to get a meeting with the deputy minister. Uh, and he's already impressed because, you know, it doesn't happen everywhere in the world that, you know, within a week of meeting an ambassador, you're on a plane to meet a deputy minister. Um, I think that the, the, the general experience is that the euphoria and elation of meeting the deputy minister turns into frustration because uh, there's normally no follow-up or little follow-up. And sooner than later there's a realization that even though deputy minister deputy minister he's not a decision maker um he's a technocrat and um then the challenge becomes to meet someone higher up the food chain um and you know some companies because they are large and because the president is going on a delegation to that company country and wants to in the presence of the other country's leader find MOUs with, 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 with the key players. Um, those companies can find themselves getting access to the minister or a deputy prime minister. But again, that's no um, guarantee that their project is going to be seriously um, considered. Um, so it is an issue. Um, I, I think that one of the, one of the challenges is getting intermediaries involved. Now, I, I don't mean 
so people who are making money from um it, you know guarding who gets access to the the, the court um i mean clearly there's that going on and let, let's not um be, be naive but I, I i think when you have you know a, a sort of privatization process that gains momentum and you have certain investment banks who are involved who are trying to reach out to different investing universes and they become trusted intermediaries and you know, that they, they function as intermediaries all over the world. It's their, their, their job, that they earn a good fee for it, but they, they play a role. Um, then, you know, maybe you will start to see more sort of normal sort of interaction um, in that, you know, it's not just Rothschilds. It, it, it's Rothschilds and a number of um, investment banks and intermediaries who are regularly interfacing with, different deputy ministers and ministers and there's there's more fluidity um but yeah i i think short answer is if it's a big project then you you, you will probably end up needing to, to meet the top guy um and um make it clear what you plan to do that you're not gonna make a mess um because ultimately he takes responsibility for what's going on so that, that, that there might well not be, you know, a sinister reason for it. It's simply that, you know, that he wants to know or people around him want to know that um, the investor is coming with good intention and will deliver what they, what, 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 what they promise because they are ultimately accountable for it. Yeah. Very good. I have a speculative question and a difficult one, but one that uh, I would be remiss in not, uh, asking, and one that you might have given some thought to, which is about the war in Ukraine. And, you know, there's lots of different scenarios for how it ends, some with Russia gaining the upper hand, uh, some with Ukraine gain, getting the upper hand. There are scenarios of, uh, you know, a shorter ending, much less likely, I think, uh, increasingly, um, scenarios for a much longer game, uh, what impact does the outcome and the length of the invasion of Ukraine have on uh, Uzbekistan? So that's a, that, that could have been a topic all in and of itself. Uh, but if you could say a few words about it, I, th I think that would be helpful. Well, <clears throat> as we sort of emphasized in the introduction, yeah. um, one of the reasons the storm wasn't as as hard as was was thought it would be a year ago is because the Russian economy uh, didn't drop off a cliff. I mean, the the slowdown was two point two percent, not fifteen. Um, and the linkage is it is 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 easy to understand. It's about remittance. You know, it, it's it's twenty three percent of GDP we talked about. It's also about trade. I mean, you know, Russia is still Uzbekistan's largest trading partner. I think it's about forty percent in terms of volume. So. The, the health of the Russian economy is critical to Uzbekistan, and that's not going to change. Right. Um, there's, you know, the, the, the exchange rate has stabilized, um, so you're not seeing massive flows one way or another, um, because obviously the central bank has introduced currency and capital co controls. Um, so, so that's sort of baked in anyhow. Um, I mean, I, I, I think. There was a, obviously a existential moment of sort of doubt um, at, the, at the beginning uh, of the invasion in that um, clearly certain people, I mean, Camilo, the former minister, I think he was quite quick out the blocks and almost um, criticised the invasion and then he was pulled back and I don't know if he was admonished, but, um, you know, clearly he, he, he'd probably been a little more vocal and forthright than was expected and um the excuse that's given is that there are a lot of wishbacks in, in 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 russia and ultimately if things get nasty in russia then you know the wishbacks will bear the brunt of it because um you know russia is becoming a, a nastier place and um they those economic migrants they're, they're not treated particularly nicely to start off with so you know, the, the, I think to that extent, if, if you were sitting in the Uzbek government, you, you, you would 
perhaps go out of your way to to, to maintain a better relationship with Russia than your, your Western colleagues would perhaps want you to. Um, so yeah, I mean, in answer to your question, I, I think if the war does continue, um, as as, I, as we expect for you know good good period longer, then the the, the, the the challenges of managing all that are just going to persist. Um, if 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 the price cap on products that was introduced on fifth of February really does start to kick in, and we 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 won't see that, will we, in for another two or three months? Because at the moment, yes, the figures in January didn't look great because there was excessive expenditure, but they, that they explained that as one-off military expenditure. Um, there was a reform of the tax system, so the tax revenue dropped through the floor. So, you know, some people have looked at that moment in time and said, you know, this is it. You know, the Russian economy is 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 going down the toilet. I mean, that's clearly not the case, and we ha we can't come to that conclusion without seeing a trend, and we won't see a trend for three or four months. Um, but yeah, I mean, if 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 we work on the assumption that the Russian economy won't invest a lot in big ticket projects, the, 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 there's none of the sort of national champion infrastructure technology type projects that they had planned, but it still manages to sort of maintain more or less levels of activity, even if it's downgraded activity, and the grow, growth is zero, but there isn't you know, a recession, then if that's the scenario for the next year or two at least, with a price cap on products, with obviously Russian crude and Russian products reaching other markets who who are you know less concerned about complying with the price cap, um, then Uzbekistan will probably you know be constantly concerned about what could happen, but will just it, the, the relationship will continue as is. Um, I think that's the most likely scenario from what I see that at least the next year, I mean, the, the, the human suffering and of course the loss of life will will increase. But I think, you know, if, if this does last another 12 months, um, I can't see Russia being in a very different position than it is now. I mean, you, you, you have far more insight on that than me, but I could imagine it being pretty much the same politically and pretty much the same economically. Um, yeah, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about possibilities for uh, economic relations with Ukraine for Uzbekistan? Uh, you know, Russia is not the only place that uh, Uzbeks could migrate to in a, you know, uh, a post-war scenario with capital flowing in, uh, which is not an unreasonable uh, suggestion, I think, for Ukraine. Um, and I also think about China, which, you know, people forget that you know, Ukraine and China also had pretty good economic relations. Uh, and, you know, they're not on the same scale as with Russia, but they're also not negligible. So I'm just, you know, if you could think even beyond 12 months looking forward. Um, well, I mean, U Ukraine was a um, trading partner with Uzbekistan. I mean, it wasn't in the top three. The, the, the top three are Russia, Turkey and, and Kazakhstan. So clearly it's down the list. Um, but yes, I mean, I think there's a lot of sympathy and certainly with, with some of my clients, you know, they have friends who are successful Ukrainian businessmen. And, you know, I would think on a personal level, yeah, if and when the war ends, you know, successful individuals will go out of their way to, 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 to develop that relationship. I mean, uh, a, a lot of this is down to personal choice, isn't it? And, I already see, you know, clients who, even though it might be at cost or might be at reducing margins, are picking up teams of Ukrainian Aitishniki or, mm -hmm. you know, people who clearly now are struggling to find work. Um, you know, and we, 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 we've done some structuring where, you know, the, 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 the currency regulations and the, the, the immigration law and the employment law doesn't help but they still want to know, you know, can we have Ukrainians employed either in Tashkent or can we employ them from Tashkent? Um, and yeah, as I said, you know, some parts of the Uzbek reforms aren't felt at the micro level, and one of those would be payments. 
for services. So there's an assumption, you know, that um, you, well, it's always questioned the, 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 the level and why. So withholding tax is imposed and um, it's a cost on business, but people still do it because they want to support. Um, so so I, I think, yeah, Uzbekistan, you know, as an individuals and, and collectively, they, they, they will be looking for opportunities to, to, to work with Ukraine. And you, you do, you know, you see a lot of Aichishniki in, in Tashkent, I mean, not necessarily Ukrainians, because I think a lot of people who have been part of that sector have probably gone west. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, Uzbeks are, I think, supportive of people who have who are coming out of conflict you know I, I, I haven't at least from what i have seen personally you, you don't sense hostility the opposite you know they're, they're very generous and um you know clearly there's money to be made from having talented young um people either ukrainian belarusian or, or, or russian um it's a, it's a chance for uzbekistan to start exporting those sorts of services um so yeah i, I think there will be yeah positive development there not an easy question and one that, that we're all thinking about it uh, still over effects of the war um, and how they'll continue to affect these countries going forward um, well this has been terrific uh you know as i said when we were talking before this is the kind of talk that i love with it's related to uh, and it, but adjacent to the thing that I spend most of my time thinking about. So I learn a lot um, and it really does help put uh, uh, you know, issues of general importance uh, in, the, in, a, in its proper context. And uh, so join me uh, in, in thanking Lewis Skiner. Um, and uh, the recording will be made available via YouTube, uh, if I'm uh, correct, and we should be able to find it uh, through the Harriman website. So, uh, Lewis, thank you very much. Uh, Pleasure. And uh, we look forward to having you back again. Uh, and uh, good luck. Thanks for the invitation, Tim. And thank you, everyone, for, for listening. And please don't hesitate to ask any questions uh, through, through Harriman if you have any. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye now. Bye-bye.